I'm a business man, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Ooh, yeah. I'm a business man, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Ooh, yeah. I'm a business man, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business man, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Ooh, yeah. Crystal Mitchell, do you have my business plan? Just review the page. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gilbert Buchanan, the small business paramedic, along with Crystal Mitchell. And today, Crystal, we're going to have a great show. We're going to have a fantastic show. So they're calling this Black History Month. Yeah, this is that month where um, we as black folks get to stand out. That's the only time. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah. So according to them, yeah, it's the only time we get to stand out. So it's a time when people besides ourselves are talking about us and and and, and relishing in our history and homage uh, homage to our ancestors. And then after the twenty eight days, we only have twenty eight days. We got the shortest. We have the shortest day of the month. I mean, the shortest month of the yeah. year. But however, we're in the month of love. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to uh, send a message out there to our entrepreneurs, Crystal, that this 28 days is not the only days that we can recognize ourselves as entrepreneurs people, especially with uh, you know our new president who think that we should be in a little corner over there somewhere. So, well, actually, he thinks they think we should be on the plantation. I know. Is where they think we I should know. be. That's what that's what return to America to the great America really means. Make it great again. Make, make it great again <laughs> means uh, we are on the plantation making money for them and making them ultra rich and we ultra poor. Uh, so we got that all that paradigm that shift. We didn't shift it that paradigm, and that is why we're here as the business zone because we're talking about wealth for our own. That's community, what we're talking about, and we're Crystal. talking about taking care of ourselves and and this is a good time to do that because you know when we look at black history and when we pay homage to those that came before us those that uh, came out of slavery and 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 created amazing wealth for themselves and and their families uh, they didn't even have the opportunities that we have and so we have some incredible opportunities that if we get focused and structured and, 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 and eliminate the fear, then we can do some incredible things. So that's why the Business Zone is here, is to give you that encouragement, uh, to beat you up sometimes if we have to. Well, uh, the, the first thing I want to put out there, Crystal, to our entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, if you're listening, I want you to tune in today because... Running your business is not only for a 28- or a 30-day period of time. (laughs) Running your business is ongoing. It's throughout the whole year and continuously. So I just want to put that out there, entrepreneurs. Black History Month, it doesn't mean that you're just going to recognize blackness for 28 days. It's going to be throughout the whole year. We're throughout the whole year, and we're going to do business the way we're supposed to, and we're going to acquire wealth. Uh, we have some amazing guests today. One is going to talk about how we develop wealth. Our, 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 our guest last week, that's what we talked about. And actually this month was, in addition to being Black History Month, it was um, creating wealth in our community. And I think we actually started it in January when we had – uh, Dr. George Frazier on, and that's that's the platform that we need to be operating from. That's the paradigm that we need to be operating from Definitely. is how we create wealth, how we maintain wealth, how we create legacies. And um, for me, it's about children. It, it's about um, what, or what kind of world are we going to leave for our children? Mm-hmm. If we were to leave today, this would not be the world we'd want to leave. It not would, as crazy and chaotic. We're really, as really, really worried. It really, really, really worried. worried. So we're we're going to celebrate you. We're 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 going to learn to collaborate. We're going to learn how to create collect uh, cooperative economics. Um, we're going to shift our mindset and get rid of all the garbage that doesn't work for us anymore and hasn't worked for us. And we're going to make our ancestors proud of us. You know, it's amazing, Crystal. They're talking about African Americans being entrepreneurs right now. We were some of the first entrepreneurs ever because the thing is, back in the day, Mm -hmm. and we all know what day that was, okay? (laughs) Back in the day, we weren't allowed to purchase anything from anybody else, anyone else. Mm -hmm. So we had to purchase among ourselves, and that's how the entrepreneur spirit 
the entrepreneurship spirit started right. because we had to sell among ourselves. We bartered. We were the first one to have flea markets. Right. We're the first one to have those those squares, those town squares that we go together and we exchange. Hey, I got a chair over here. What do you have for that? Oh, okay, I got a pot. You want right. this pot? And that was bartering, right? That's that how we got started. In fact, the very first time I went to Jamaica and I was on a cruise ship and I came off. Got, got, where did we go? I think we were in the Gal. Might have been the Gal. We came off the ship. And as soon as you came off the ship and walked through town, there was this marketplace yes and it was there and they were bartering and yeah. and i was like oh, i had to buy something because yes. they weren't letting up man they that's, were like uh, no ma'am you we... gotta buy it i didn't even like what i bought but here i just <laughs> buy i just buy that's so. how it works <laughs> that's how the whole entrepreneurship spirit started so i don't know why you know some folks think that they should try to get us educated now and say hey you need to learn about entrepreneurship what we need to learn right now as entrepreneurs is the, 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 the significance of owning property. The significance of owning property own because property. that's where the wealth is. We gotta and own even property. then when um, a number of the freemen and we're going I'm going I have uh, three um, uh, of our ancestors that I'm gonna pay homage today in our black black history moments and I'm going one, a couple of them when they became free, that's what they did. Even those that was part of the deal. So, you know, a number of years ago I was watching a sh one of the judge shows and this young man, he was about 26 years old. His 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 major was uh, history. Mm -hmm. And so he did. He was a historian. Yeah. So he did the uh, research and he got his DNA yeah. and he found out that his family was from. You know, he knew where his family was. I saw that show. Remember show? I saw and that show. And the young show. man took the, the plantation owner's great granddaughter to yeah. court. Oh, yeah. Because his uncle was still a sharecropper. Mm -hmm. On the court, oh, yeah. on the on the land, and he actually had done his DNA, so he knew he was connected to the the the, um, the plantation owner, and he found a bill of sale for his great great grandmother, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he could prove with his DNA mm -hmm. that he was related to the family. Right. And so when the family created the will, yeah. they left. Let's say just for the oh, say they the excluded Harris. him. Right. They, well, they said <laughs> the Harris, whoever we'll use Harris for the, for just for the sake of a name, yes. but let's say Harris, whoever are the living heirs of the Harris family, they were now to be left, they were bequeathed the land. Mm -hmm. Well, this young man and his uncle were from the black side, yeah. and then this woman was from the white side. Yeah. Now, when he did his Ancestry.com, he, smart enough, he connected with her, oh, yeah. and they were all excited because they had found each uh -huh. other, right? But now he'd already gotten, yeah. and they went and did an extra DNA oh, test. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was no question that he was part of their lineage, I right? remember. And so the judge, and I think it was Judge Maybelline, Judge yeah. Maybelline said, well, I'm so sorry, ma'am, but uh, this young man here, he is absolutely right. He's got proof. We, he he has proof, and so it says heirs. It didn't say you particularly right. to be to receive your grandfather's land, yes. and so that was a precedence, I think. Oh yeah. Um. So he, the uncle, of course, took the money. The young man looked at the uncle like, uh, you know, you've taken the land, and and so they had to split the land, and yeah. and and the the person, um, she had to buy him out, and that was how it took place. So that was how, and even as sharecroppers or even part of the freedom papers, yeah. they were able to acquire their land. Oh, so yeah. after I saw that, I was like, oh man, let me call my uncle. So, so <laughs> we had probably our, a piece of lander <laughs> somewhere with your name on it, <laughs> right? So I called my uncle because we had done our DNA. My mom before she. Uh, um, transition. She had done a whole thing on our family, so I know everything. I even know the man that came over on the ship that got out of jail. Oh, I man. even know his name. <laughs> I know exactly where I came from <laughs> from that side. Now my next step is to find out my African uh, village, but I do know where I came from in Africa. But I called my uncle and said, "Hey, yo, do we have some land?" He said, "No, nah, baby, you, your grandmother already got her land. <laughs> they had already given her her land. So I'm gonna tell the rest of you guys out there, go get your." DNA go and go get your out. go get your acres. You <laughs> go know. get your forty acres there's, and a move, there's, mule. <laughs> there's probably a few acres <laughs> laying around there for you. For you. The, the next thing I want to point out there, Crystal, uh, and this bothers me a lot. I talked about it a little bit last week, but I just want to reiterate that on this program. So, how many of you 
of being in the community. You've got this favorite little restaurant or this favorite little store that you love to go to and purchase from, only to find out that when you go next week or next month, it's no longer there. <laughs> because the landlord figured out that, hey, this small business is making some money, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna jack up the rent. Yep. And because of that, small businesses, we really can't afford the high rent, so now we have to move. So you've established your client pool, you've got your, 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 your pool of customers, Right. you're getting your branding built, Right. and now all of a sudden you gotta pack up shop and go somewhere else. You don't own the building. Oh yeah, you, you don't no own the building. No and rights. that's what I'm saying, that small business, you need to try to own the building. And if you don't know how to do that, you wanna call Crystal or myself here, at the studio, we will sit down with you guys and we will make sure that happens. You don't want to lose out on any opportunities anymore. The other groups, the other groups, they don't lease, they don't rent, they purchase. They become landlords. So that's what we got to do. Chris. That's what we have. And we have a guest today, and that's his area of expertise. He's a land developer. His name is Mr. Thomas uh, T.J. Lofton. Oh, yeah. And he's going to talk to us about how you can make that happen. I from can't a land, wait. From being a land developer. So before we get to him, let's talk about, um, but before I get that, you you made a point, you made a comment there about, um, you know, they're moving you out. I was at a meeting. Uh, I, I, I participated in a couple of amazing um uh, conferences this week and so one of them was the housing um uh for workers yes, that was yes. the one that mel wilson who was here last week on our show was a guest on our show and there was a young man there was a guy that got up and we broke out into two two breakout sessions and that was the conversation was he says where in the constitution does it say anything about monitor moratoriums and uh a domain where they can move you out of your building exactly. or take your property exactly. and move you out there ain't nowhere in the nowhere. constitution that it talks about that. No way. So, um, so that was some interesting stuff that and appeared. You know why it's not in the Constitution? Because we're not a protected species. The same thing with the Native Americans. The, the U.S. government has signed over 400 treaties with the Native Americans, and not one of them they've kept. Not That's one. Right. No, right. That's what's going look, on. Look at what's going on right now with the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They never kept one. But so, then again, we got to come back to entrepreneurship. Yeah. We got to come back to land ownership. We got to come back to legacy. That's what I'm talking about. Because that was, that's what gives you a voice is to have some, a vested interest. You got to have some money on the table right. and you have to have some money so that you can go get your high power lawyers. Yeah. Everything that we've heard um, uh, Trump's talk about was you know, all we I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue you in a court. Yeah. I'm going to sue you in court. And yeah. that's what he does. Yeah. Um, and to a place that, you know, that that. Um, one of his hotels, there's like five liens on it because he, he won't pay the people. That's what I'm it's, talking about. It is ridiculous. About. But um, before we move off into our, all our crazy, uh, what we got about that man, because that man will make you your blood pressure go up. I think my <laughs> blood pressure has been like 10, <laughs> like 10 degrees higher. I went to the doctor and they're like, oh my God, what's wrong with your pressure? It, it's Washington is what's wrong with my We're pressure. We're going to have to send you on a vacation <laughs> there, Crystal. <laughs> right, exactly. So thank God for Zumba. Um <laughs> It's the only thing keeping me sane. But um, we're going to pay homage to a couple of our ancestors that uh, made some phenomenal inroads at, in, in for the black for the black people for us. Yes. Uh, the first one is George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born and and this is and and he's very significant because I just had a conversation with someone and we're talking about doing a float in the Rose Pro Parade. Uh, next year, uh, the president of the Rose, Pasadena Rose Bowl, he's going he's gonna to be an African-American. So I'm talking to some people about uh, what would it cost to put a float in place. And, and I have some friends that actually sit on the boards. And they're like, they were saying that was like fantastic. That is great. So that is great. So when I brought it up to someone, actually, it, it, it was a conversation that I was having with my co-director, Recycling Black Dollars co-director, mm -hmm. Jackie B. And she was saying, There's, I don't think I've ever seen a Rose Bowl that was a, a float that was black that was uh, by black people. That's true. And I thought, well, actually, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, Muriel Shabazz, mm -hmm. who is uh, the owner and proprietor of Shabazz Fish, and she was sent. As a matter of fact, Crystal, there is somebody that has a file this thick 
with information about a float, and that float would be in honor of George Washington wow, Carver. that's amazing. And so when I relayed that to a good friend of mine, he says, oh, my God, that's awesome. And then we're thinking of flanking him because that was he was an innovator, yeah. he was an inventor, he was just an amazing man, right? And then flank that by small businesses, and not just here in Los Angeles, but nationwide, mm -hmm. and, and they're supporting that float. Yeah. And I think that's an excellent idea. So I'm going to have a sit-down with with him and the individual who has, she's got some ideas, she's got um, a means for raising the funds, and this has been a passion. She says it's been on it, it's been a dream of hers for the last 10 That's years. That's great. Yeah, so that, that could be great. pretty cool. Wouldn't that oh, be awesome? That will be, that will be a game changer right there. <laughs> that would be a game changer, and that would be so amazing for Recycling Black Dollars. Um, and that would be a great legacy for oh. Recycling Black Dollars. And that would right be, be right in the vein of what Muhammad Nazardine stood for. Yeah. So, um, so George Washington Carver, born in 1864, died in 1943. His life uh, was perhaps one of the history's most famous African-American innovators. He born at the end of the Civil War. George and his mother were kidnapped by co Confederate night raiders, and he was dis he was discovered by a name man named Moses Carver. His mother disappeared forever, and his father is unknown. Growing up on Moses' farm, he earned the nickname of the Plant Doctor and collected rocks and plants of all sorts. His achievement achievements Carver is known for being an agricultural chemist. He discovered three hundred uses for peanuts and hundreds and more. Uses uses for soybean, pecans, and sweet potatoes. These uses included recipes improvement to for adhesives, axle grease, bleach, buttermilk, ink, linoleum, mayonnaise, tender, meat tenderizer, metal polish, shaving cream, shoe polish, synthetic rubber, talcum powder, and wood stain. And at one point in his life, he declined an invitation to work for a salary of more than 100000 a year in today's time, and that would be a million dollars, to continue his research on behalf of his countrymen. On July 14, 1943, United States President um, Delano Roosevelt honored Carver with a national monument dedicated to his achievements. That is phenomenal. So now everything there... See, that's us. That's what we did. We need to put that on our website because not too many people know this story. Yeah. We need to do that. And and and, and, and when I was speaking to the, the person that I'm going to work with on the float, she says, and this is only just a, just a synopsis. That's, that's, just, that's the, just brief. See, this is basically what I was talking about earlier, that we are some of the first entrepreneurs. Yeah. You see, you see, that's an evidence right there. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. That, that's, that's evidence of it. So, and then, of course, we all know Madam C.J. Walker. He was born in 1867 mm -hmm. to 1919. Madam C.J. Walker was born Sarah Breed Lowe in Louisiana. She was the first member of her family to be born free to parents who had been slaves. At age 14, she married a man named Moses McWilliams and was widowed at age 20. She then moved to St. Louis and worked as a laundress for as little as a dollar and a half a day. Her achievement says, I am a woman who comes from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I promoted of to the wash tub. From there, I promoted to the uh, kitchen, cook kitchen, and from there, I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. I have built my own factory on my own ground. Uh, she founded the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company to sell hair care products and cosmetics. Madam Walker moved her manufacturing operation from St. Louis to a new industrial complex in Indianapolis. By 1917, she had the largest business in the United States owned by an African-American. She saw her personal wealth as not as an end in itself, but as a means to promote economic opportunities for others, especially black people. She took pride in the profitability in uh, in, in employment. Uh, her company afforded many thousands of black women who women who worked as commission agents that could earn from five dollars to fifteen dollars a day. Unskilled and white laborers were making around eleven per week, and she actually became a millionaire in nineteen in the nineteen hundreds. Unbelievable. So those oh, that's where we come from. So when I and it's very hard when I hear people say this is too hard for me to do or um, or or they're not doing business the right way. 
they didn't have the same opportunities that we had. That's right. So there is there are no excuses in my book That's because there I'm are people about. that came before us that had a much harder time. Mm -hmm. And I haven't even gotten next week. I'm going to I'm going to move over to Black Wall Street yeah. and hear these people. The whole town yeah. was nothing but very. Pri they had an airport. They had private planes. They were living very well. Um, but again, um, you don't hear about that. Well, right. Well, we, you know, and what I find absolutely amazing is there are still people today that don't know anything about Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll go, where is that? I've never heard about that. Or, wow, I didn't know that existed. So um, and there have been movies and so forth about it. But and I think Oprah is actually doing a movie about Black about Black Wall Street. Yeah. So this is why we have to stay connected with our history. This is why we know that we come from greatness. Because if you know where you come from, then you know where you're you going. You know where you're going. You don't have to, no one can tell you anything about you. Because yeah. you know about you more than they know about yeah. you and you know what you're capable of doing. Exactly. So when I think about yeah. our ancestors, and these are the people that weren't related to me, but I know what my own family did. Right. And and the achievements that they made and and everybody else that we know can go back just in their own personal history and and, and discover the greatness that resides within their own DNA and they're within their own gene pool. So um, that is our, our our homage, our homage for Black History Month oh, yeah. um, and, and our ancestors that did some miraculous things and with all kinds of challenges that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, but before we bring up our next guest, I really want to cover this real quick. So I think I mentioned to you that I went to a meeting. Uh, it was called the Partnership in Lending in the Underserved Markets, called yes. Plum, and it's an initiative that. Do you, you want to talk about it now? Because we only have two minutes. You want to talk about it now, or you want to? We can talk about it. You want to talk about? You no, no, talk? we'll wait. Okay. Okay. Because we'll that's I think that's very valuable information. Oh, it is. It's uh, we amazing don't just, information. We don't just want to gloss over <laughs> and just talk about the okay. piece of it. We want to talk about it in depth. Okay, because that, that works for me. That is critical stuff. That's very important to the survival of African American small businesses. Works for me. Okay, okay let's do so that. Do we want to do a break? Well, um, let's, let's go ahead and take a break right now. We'll come back, and this is a business zone with Crystal and Gilbert Buchanan, the small business paramedic. All righty, take a break. Okay. Hello, meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186. Africa watching us, guys. Welcome back to the Business Zone. This is Gilbert Buchanan, the small business paramedic, along with... 
Christo Mitchell. And today we've got a great show for you. We're celebrating uh, Black History Month, and we've got some great guests on the show. But before we get into our guest, our phone number here is 323-293-3375. That's 323-293-3375. I'd like all of you to call in today, participate in this program, because this is phenomenal. Crystal? It is, and I want to welcome everyone that's coming on Facebook Live. Margo, hello. Naja, hello. Daryl, hello. And I believe we have a, a, watch, a viewer from Africa. Oh, uh, welcome to the Re show, viewer. <laughs> Mr. Remexa Odiba Osi, Osi, I think. I probably messed all that up, and I am very, very sorry, but thank you for tuning in to us on Facebook Live. And so, we are. I am very honored, and we are very honored to have an incredible guest on the show. And I was, and I, and I have to give a little background here because I was thinking, wow, I had one guest that I'd already confirmed, and I'm thinking, wow, we probably need another little guest. And what am I going to do for Black History Month? And and what what? Yeah, you know, I need to do something a little bit spectacular. Last week I had a little video, and then out of the blue, hey Daryl, um, out of the blue, I get a call from Gwen. And she called me to tell me that she had written this amazing commentary, and it was on Black History mm, Month mm, and why mm. we should celebrate. It's like, wow, thank you, Lord. Mm, he just mm, brings mm. you what you need, when you need it, and how you need <laughs> it. And so we talked for about two hours yesterday about some incredible stuff. I learned some, I learned some things about uh, Gwen that I didn't know because I know her from a business perspective. And uh, she has been an activist and done her thing. And, and so let me read a little bit about Mrs. Mrs. Gwen Lang Jones, a transplant of Jacksonville, Florida, and a lover of music. Gwen sang her way through high school and earned a full-time music scholarship to college. Her high school glee club had the honor to sing. She had the, her high school glee club had the honor to sing to Mary, um, uh, Math uh, Mathow. Mathow Cloud, Bethune on Mother's Day, the Sunday prior to her death. Now, that's amazing. They were also honored as being the first high school chorus to sing on the floor of the house. And after graduation from Edwards Water College, she migrated to Los Angeles. Because her music scholarship was non-transferable, Gwen found it necessary to enter the workforce, and she la later decided to re-enter school to pursue her degree in sociology. Upon graduating from Cal State University in Los Angeles, she joined the Equitable Life Assurance so Society of the United States as a financial service representative. During her tenure, she received numerous awards and recognition for outstanding sales and managerial performance. She was voted Businesswoman of the Month of Century City by the Century City Chamber of Commerce and was recognized by Jet Magazine as the first black female district manager in the entire history of Equitable. Gwen's community involvement includes as past president of uh, Toastmasters. Is that what it is? International Toastmasters? Mistress. Mistress. And... Uh, a center's international training and communication club, past vice president of Black Women's Network, past president of the California African American Museum Service Council, souvenir uh, publication chair of Daniel Freeman Hospital Auxiliary. Gwen was also awarded a certificate for outstanding community service by Mayor James Hahn. Additionally, Gwen is a member of the Delta Sigma Theta Society a sorority. Retired for 15 years, Gwen enjoys spending time with her family. She has edited a book, co-authored a book, and she is enjoying writing poetry and is currently working on a book. Gwen recently celebrated her 56th wedding anniversary with her husband, Walter. They are mm. the proud parents of two adult children and two grandchildren, Amari and Malik. Malik. And Malik. And I want to welcome you. Wow, some of this stuff I didn't know about, and I am even more honored now than I was when, and I've known you for about three, five, five six, longer than that. About seven or eight years. I, Almost ten years. I told I you we were know. in the company of royalty. Right, you <laughs> called it, man. I told you. <laughs> so Gwen is going to... Um, read to us a commentary that she authored in 2012 on why we must celebrate 2008, why we must continue to celebrate Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn it. But before you read, 
Would you like to say anything else about yourself that wasn't covered in that wonderful bio? Well, that's, that's it? That's mostly it. Okay. Um, well, I am, as I said, from Florida. I'm from a large family, mother and father, and nine siblings. Wow. Welcome to the show. Yes. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. <laughs> and from the experiences that I had in Florida, there were breathtaking many of them. And one day for a black history program, which I coordinated for my church, I just decided to sort of spill my guts a little. Okay. And play, put it on paper. Okay. And the next year I added a little to it, and it ended up this way. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Well, let's, let's hear it then. Uh, you, can you, you got <coughs> Excuse me. Why we should continue to celebrate Black History Month. A philosopher once said, if you don't know your history, you are likely to repeat it. With this in mind, I reflected on my past, a similar path for which many of you have traveled. As a little Negro girl born and raised in the South, in a cesspool of overt ignorance, bitterness, hatred, and outright racism, I was taught to love God, to do unto others as I'd have them do unto me. And I was also taught invaluable techniques for survival in such a horrid environment. Along the way, I was victimized by the colored and white water fountains, riding in the back of the bus, having to use the bathroom prior to going downtown to shop because there may not be a restroom to accommodate me, eating before leaving home or being certain to carry a sandwich along to prevent inevitable hunger pains as we could not enter a restaurant or be served at a lunch counter. Those adjustments were necessary due to the unjust laws in our America the Beautiful. Mm. I can remember so very well when I would witness blatant race, racial discrimination, express my sentiments very quietly, or swallow my pride and not reference it at all. I believe in and support our Constitution as the cornerstone of our democracy, to embrace our allegiance and to hone the spirit of equality, to be ever fair, ever good, and vehemently devour hypocrisy and prohibit its inhabitants from taunting its beauty with obscure immorality. Although many of our laws have been modified to be held in high regard, there is yet an enormous amount of toxic minds that employ a reckless disregard. It has been avowed that it is no longer necessary to celebrate Black History Month or to sing the anthem, We Shall Overcome, because a black man as president shows that we have overcome. Conversely, it is my perspective as a proud black woman that the cause for the celebration will never grow old and its significance must be fervently echoed to keep us in the fold. Perpetual racism divulges that enough is enough. But when I convey my, doc my discontent, I'm often told that I'm being a little too tough. So, for better clarification, I will articulate my rationale in rhyme. Why Black History Month should be widely respected and vigorously celebrated to the end of time. Our life's journey in the motherland allowed us a free spirit with a yearning to learn until one day formidable acts of torment forced us to enter the door 
of no return. Our arduous voyage to the Americas was unwelcomed indeed, as determination and drive gave us a strong will to succeed. We were arrogantly dehumanized with little to no exception, and we were compelled to fulfill our duties without obvious deception. With a great sense of pride among us and a longing to sustain, we did everything in our power to simply adjust and not complain. The struggle made it considerably difficult for immediate adjustment, but with God's help, we forged ahead as we strived for advancement. Heartfelt degradation was applied with a, lit, with a small degree of fuss. Thus, it made our level of progress appear nil or highly oblivious. Greed and profits were the main motives in mind, and seldom was compassion displayed in kind. While honor, worth, and prestige became the order of the day, hardship was a constant and was demonstrated without fair play. The transition from stress was stressful and unbearable reality, for the survivors of the voyage experienced a senseless inequity. They were the keepers of the dream. African Americans are strong, proud people and products of a rich legacy. Therefore, we must never allow others to make us feel inferior because of their incurable jealousy. Motivation, innovation, and collaboration are descriptive of our ancestral tradition influenced by nobility, pride, dignity, and a uniquely spiritual intuition. We are kings, queens, conquerors in the ultimate reality and the ultimate royalty, and we possess the fortitude to make all dreams a reality. Innately, our hearts ring out with kindness and love for our nation to be countered by hate, anger, envy, and inhumane humiliation. Historically, we have been scorned, abused, and placed in a state of dismal isolation. We have been ignored and oftentimes forced into a mere bit brink of desolation. We were crowned with an astonishing spirituality, for our gifts blaze the trail with our individual genius and originality. We laugh, we joke, we sing, we dance, and we often clown around to be reminded daily of the ruthless institutionalized bound. Our inborn wisdom has instilled in us our strong will to innovate, while others feel an enormous need, and absurd desire to emulate. The enormous contributions of blacks in these United States of America are representative of the unmitigated genius that we brought with us from Africa. We have contributed n notably to this country in all areas, education, sports, entertainment, art, science, entrepreneurship, and politics as well. Though many deemed the transformation so unfair, they decided to rebel. Numerous contributions by African Americans have been obviously recognized, while others appeared absolutely ignored to crop up later as an original from where they had been intentionally stored. The truth of who we are and why we should be revered from sea to shining sea is precisely inscribed in the archives of America's written decree. Let us forget 
Let us forever give honor to the works of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who blazed the trail for millions to follow. Langston Hughes, Joe Lewis, Ma Rainey, Dick Gregory, Oprah Winfrey, Harry Belafonte, Pearl Bailey, Althea Gibson, Bill Cosby, Malcolm X, Biddy Mason, Barbara Jordan, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Also, Colin Powell, Danny Bakewell, Jackie Robinson, Louis Farrakhan, Dinah Washington, James Weldon Johnson, Lena Horne, Denzel Washington, Magic Johnson, Marion Anderson, James Brown, Dr. Mark Dean, architect of the digital revolution with more than 20 patents to his credit. Maya Angelou, Michael Jackson, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Dr. Dorothy Height, and President Barack Hussein Obama, just to name a few of the incredible black heroes and sheroes and how they have profoundly impacted the history of this country. Our job to hold America accountable for equality is a most challenging one, but it must but it remains our responsibility to do our part until our freedom is won. The time is now for all Americans to stand up for injustice and refrain from the unprecedented bitterness that has been consistently spewed around the country for the past several hundred years. We must acknowledge and support and cur- and the courage that has been demonstrated under the leadership of our capable President Barack Obama and give homage to his numerous accomplishments that were made in a very short time, namely his focus on health care reform, housing, education, increased pay, and benefits for military personnel, and the list goes on and on. Dr. Martin Luther King once said that there is nothing in the world more dangerous than the sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity, as exhibited by some, as uttered daily from the relentless sea of bigotry by Ginrich, Limbaugh, Beck, O'Reilly, Palin, and Hannity. Their deplorable hatred epitomizes the ultimate negativity, and it connotes but a sad commentary of our country, tis of thee. Yes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And to eradicate injustice, we must continue to stake our claim. The struggle for parity is constant due to insurmountable ignorance and frustration that gives perpetual cause for an ongoing commemoration. So, until the laws of justice are recognized and adhered to throughout our inflexible nation, let us walk together with heads held high and continue Carter G. Woodson's Black History Month celebration to be celebrated not only during the month of February on a special day, but we must pay tribute to this laudable celebration today and every day. Wow. Powerful, powerful, (laughs) powerful. Wow. Unity alone. Was, yeah, that was from the heart. <laughs> from the heart. And that from was in 2008. Heart. So, boy, you had to pin that today. <laughs> wow. Same thing. The same thing. It's the exact same thing. Things but change, but gosh. they remain the same. While, while you were reading, I was thinking, hmm, Crystal and I, we need to have our names on that list, but we're, not, we're probably not worthy. Not yet. We're not worthy. We're coming up. We're working on it. <laughs> wow. That, I, I just. That's amazing. Fantastic. Thank That's you. amazing. And, it, and it definitely, I felt it from the heart. Um, and it just it just represents us as a people. Yes, and, and we must continue. And we must continue, mm-hmm. and and to uh, celebrate us as po- a proud people. Exactly. And that no matter what has been thrown at us, we can't let that take away from who we really are. 
That's right. And 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 the accomplishments and the accomplishments of those that came before us and those that are operating today, fighting for our cause and fighting to make sure that this world is a better place for our children. Yes, and I was about to say, pass the idea on to our children. And pass the idea because on because they children. are our future. Exactly, and Let's, this is just amazing. Miss Gwen, tell us a little bit about your experiences and how you've been using that experience today with churches, organizations, to make it happen? Well, um, most recently, it was last February, that I got permission from my grandson, who's now seven years old. He's in second grade, but mm -hmm. when he was in first grade, I got permission from his teacher to present to the class mm. black history. Very much. And I presented inventors because there are a whole lot of inventions. Oh, yes. And there would be no America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if that weren't for us. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yes. For and sure. we bring so much flavor and flair mm -hmm. into what we do. And the kids in the classroom, I had, I felt so proud because my husband was with me, our son was with me. It was his son yeah. whose class it was. Yeah. I had their undivided attention and it made me feel so good because I gave information to them. Then I asked questions of mm -hmm. each one of them to tell me something that they learned. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel so good. There was a little boy, I think he was Hispanic. And he res responded in such a profound way mm. to make me know yeah. that it had been accepted by him and understood. I hear that. And I knew when he got home, he'd have to tell his parents mm -hmm, about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel good about when I can help spread the goodness yes. and help others feel the passion that do, should be felt. Do you still have that list of inventors? Yes. If you don't mind, if you want to share it with us, we'll be happy to put it on our website. So be more than happy to. More than everyone else will know exactly who some of those great inventors are because I don't think people have a clue. Yes. I um, really don't. I mean, the elevator, the, the traffic washing light. machine. Yes. The traffic I mean, light. Every, everything that we <laughs> use was invented by yes. us. Yes. The, the light bulb. Yes. The broom. I mean, everything to make it more convenient for us, which became a, a part of our everyday life. Exactly. Which everybody is enjoying it. You know, you know what's amazing that a lot of people don't understand, and Crystal and I, we talk about this in our workshops when we're, we're teaching entrepreneurs. A lot of people start businesses because there's a pain out there in the marketplace that we need mm -hmm. to solve. Right. Yes. We became inventors because there's pain in our communities that we needed to solve. Exactly. Like with the traffic light, for example. Oh, yes. Right. Our people were being killed. Our kids were being killed all the time because they would drive through our neighborhoods. They wouldn't stop. Exactly. That's how That's the right. traffic light got invented. That's right. And you the see broom, what I mean? because we did the work in in the on in the plantations, right. yeah. uh, the the tools that were used with the, with the blacksmiths, mm -hmm. the uh, the cotton gin in order to make the world yes. easier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so everything it was to solve a solu was a solution that? to a pain that we experienced mm -hmm. from doing excruciating back breaking exactly. work and it just really galls me when people say that black people are lazy Oh, no, we are not lazy because <laughs> there is no other nationality, other race of people that could have endured the hard no. work that we would endured no just to survive. Just to, And we weren't even being fed. We weren't clothed. We weren't fed daily meals. We got the scraps and the leftovers. So, I think it's just ignorance for people to well, say Well, that's what that. she said in, in her, is, is the ignorance, is and, not knowing. And to just add to that, you mentioned George Washington Carver. Mm-hmm. Discovering the different uses of a peanut. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, what is one of the greatest snacks that we have That's today? What I'm peanut, 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 the peanut, peanut butter sandwich. And what did we talk about? <laughs> hey, peanut butter sandwich. He did <laughs> buttermilk and yeah. adhesive and mayonnaise and meat tenderizer. That's what I'm talking and about. Metal polish and shaving cream and shoe polish. All of those are things. So, what do you think about the, the idea of creating a float in honor of George Washington Carver? I love the idea. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I love the idea. It's unfortunate. It's very expensive 
to have a float in the parade. Right. We I think we found but with that. The, Collaboration that you're speaking of, it can happen, and, and that collaboration and the and the um, the uh, co- uh, cooperative economics. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that uh, the, um, the the her name is Etha, that she she has she has a file because she's done all her research and and her one of her goals is to reach out to all other organizations. And she said there are actually the state there are states that actually celebrate. George Washington Carver and all of his accomplishments is an association. So she's going to reach out to them. We're going to reach out to the youth groups and, you know, create fundraisers and, and charitable, uh, the fraternities and sororities. Uh, although I think the capitals are thinking about doing their own float okay. and they're going to reach out nationally. Um, she's going to reach out to the Deltas. I believe she is. Well, we Delta. had a float. Excuse you, me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, y'all had a float. Yes, okay. our 100 yeah, In year. fact, I think they did tell me you guys had yeah. a float. I, I think that was when I asked that question 2013 Th- 13 and so um those and then reach out to our small businesses or our businesses our black owned businesses and let them and then they have a plaque around the float but i think it costs uh two hundred fifty thousand dollars therefore yeah. this lady had done her she actually even spoke to the manufacturers right um but if you depending on how you reach out and who you reach out to um and we have enough time to raise that money i think that would be an amazing uh, opportunity for us as a people right. to display uh, our accomplishments, and especially him. He couldn't have been any more uh, the the best person to have chosen right. in her mind. So we're going to see how it, how it pans out. Um, I hope we can do that. So who did you guys, was it the, the, uh, the lineage of the Deltas? Is that who your float? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. We okay. were celebrating our 100th year. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. I know. That was an amazing. Yeah. I had some friends that were... Oh, yeah, every, and you, you were actually at that time a vendor. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, the uh, yes. Uh, jury line. Right? Uh-huh. Well, I had um, my own company on your Daniel Line Enterprises. Yes. Right. And you wanted to go there. And that's how I learned yes. so much about the Deltas yes. for you because I worked with you on right. exactly. how you wanted to, um, you were going to make that happen. I am just so pleased that you, that you called me yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> things happen the way they're supposed they're to. They're supposed to happen. This, this is amazing. And, and it was just amazing. And, and it brings to mind, I am working, I sit on a board of an organization called the Pete Brown Junior Tennis uh, Program. And uh, we are, um, it, it's a program that has been in the community for well over 50, 60 years. And Pete Brown actually provided free tennis lessons to the uh, black kids and the, those in the community for yeah, free. Good. Yeah, good. And he done that he he had been doing that on his own. He was also a coach for I think LACC, but um um uh, Marty Woods, Coach Marty Woods, actually made it a legal, made it a legal nonprofit organization. So we're having a function in March in honor of we're sending ten of our youth, our high, our elite tennis players, to Baltimore for the 100th celebration, national celebration of the American uh, Tennis Association, which is the Black Association there. And we're sending these ten kids, and so we're doing fundraisers to make that happen. So one of the things we're doing is the Living Legends Awards fundraiser breakfast brunch Mm -hmm. and it is for the legends of tennis Mm -hmm. to pass the torch on to our children and then we keep that going because in tennis as well as everything else you know you got Arthur Ashe you have Althea Gibson in fact one of the ladies that we honored last year she played tennis with Althea Gibson Mm -hmm. and there's a number of them that have been playing tennis for years and they're still playing tennis and they're in their 80s and 90s and uh, so we want to make sure that this sport is recognized for all of the legends. You know, our children only know of Serena and Venus. I know. And, I know. Our, and then if you, in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know Arthur Ashe. But prior to that, you know, they don't go back further exactly. than that. So that's one of the things. So just paying homage, even in a, in a, in a sport, to our legends that, uh, that they broke color lines. Yes, they did. They broke color yes, lines. Yeah, I remember out there Gibson. You do you? From being from Florida, yes, because she attended Florida A and M University uh-huh. with my sister, mm-hmm. and that's where actually where where the ATA is housed mm-hmm. in Florida, mm-hmm. and they have a beautiful court there in Arthur Ashe Stadium, mm-hmm. and so um, that's one of the things that we're doing in honoring those in 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 that industry. Hey, Leo, welcome! Glad you you stopped by on Facebook Live. 
I tell you, I'm going to have to, um, I, I have it in electronic. I'm going to make sure that when we clip the tape that I send this everywhere. Because okay. that was brilliant. We got to do that. And that was brilliant. We got to do that. And, and then I'm going to refer you to some people who need you to come out and recite that to them. I'll be delighted. Okay. Perfect. That's fantastic. Miss Gwen, we want to thank you for coming <laughs> on the show. This is phenomenal. Well, thanks for Now, that's the way black history is supposed to be celebrated. This, this is a learning <laughs> experience for me. So yeah. this is great. So and thank then, you so much. And for thank Gilbert, you for the opportunity. Gilbert grew up in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And so I know you guys... Not the same as America, but you had your own trials and tribulations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we were abroad straight from the slave ship to Jamaica. So. Right. Everyone <laughs> oh, has yeah. had right. their experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are, and we have our own heroes. You know, we've got Marcus Garvey and, yes. you know, all of those fine folks. Oh, yes. So, yes, we do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead, Crystal, and take a break right now. We're at the top of the hour at 4, 402. So we'll take a quick break, two minutes, and we'll be back. And if for those of for those of you entrepreneurs who are listening, I'd like you to give us a call here on our radio station at 323-293-3375. That's 323-293-3375. This is a business zone. Thank you. And we will be back in a moment. Hello. Meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186. Welcome back to the Business Zone. Uh, this is Gilbert Buchanan, the small business paramedic, along with... Christo Mitchell. And we just had a very powerful guest on our show, Miss Gwen. Miss Gwen, you're, you're, you're phenomenal. And the resource that you shared with us, the information is just the bomb. So... You know, the, the kids today, they talk about you being the bomb.com. That's what you are. <laughs> You're the bomb.com, okay? <laughs> yes, definitely the bomb.com. And, you know, we don't usually talk to uh, – we should have those conversations with our oh, yeah. with our, our, el our elders, oh, our seniors, yes. because they, they're they more than just the surface of what we see. They know so much. Right, exactly. And, see, this, this the same. that's the same conflict I'm having in my family right now because – you know, most of the elders, they're gone. Ah. The only one that's left right now is my mom, mm -hmm. and she can't really tell us much because she she's uh, she's uh, she's got dementia. Oh, so you, you know, so she doesn't even know me sometimes when I show up. You know, she's oh, like, "Who wow. are you?" You know. So I would have loved to have had this kind of conversation with her and the others back then. Yes. 
But uh, that's phenomenal. So, Crystal, we've got another guest on the show. And we do. We do. Mr. Thomas T.J. Lofton. He's a global business leader with nearly three decades of business entrepreneurial coaching experience as the former CEO of three companies. Thomas T.J. Lofton founded the three successful global businesses, including Express Gold Plating, Compton Wire Wheels, and Molded Suspension. Thomas was a manufacturer, distributor, and exclusive dealer of dozens of auto parts and accessories, supplying over 100 stores around the world. He then franchised, franchised his business, Express Gold Plating, and played a pivotal role in creating a new multi-billion dollar industry during that time. His classic cars led him into the film industry as his cars were featured in music videos, movies, and television shows. He was invited to be on the set of NWA's reunion movie, Straight Outta Compton and Driving While Black. TJ was featured in two page article in a two page article on the cover of the November issue of Wheels magazine. Today, Lofton still manufactures and ships auto parts around the world and now has a production company called Lofton. Oh, that's cute. Productions. <laughs> <laughs> he travels around the country giving workshops, coaching, consulting, and facilitating boot camps and webinars promoting the original hit concept of creating wealth from the dirt. These workshops illustrate how to think outside the box and give explanations as how to be a leader in your own industry. Lofton's prep presentations are designed to teach clients of all ages how to start lucrative businesses and create a leg and create legacies that will withstand the test of time teaching how to identify and create innovative investment opportunities and adopt the most successful habits of business-minded people and wow mr lofton welcome now Thank tj you. and i have been crossing each other's path all year long mm -hmm. all last year yeah. i think we probably last year was the first time that we became aware of each other at least right. personally right. and um so he's been at some of the conferences i've been at and and i've gotten to know him and so uh it's welcome a to the show it's sir a pleasure thank you thank truly you. appreciate it your uh, accomplishments seem very impressive and outstanding so thank you so much well, thank you thank you for, for what you here. do for us so how did you, uh, what's the humble beginnings of T.J. Lofton? How did all of this come about? And I, I assume you had an interest in cars. Is Absol that the start? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, grow up in Compton, California, which, which was the lowrider capital of the world at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's first car, main car, was a lowrider. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of people working on them. And, I'm, you know, I'm a young guy at nine years old. I want to. Touch and feel, and I want a car. Okay, you, know, so. <laughs> you want a car? Yeah, I'm attracted. Can I? Can I ride? Can I? <laughs> can I just hang around you guys? And the guy, one of my buddies, said, "Yeah, matter of fact, go pick up that heavy battery." <laughs> you know. <laughs> so they, my first, one of my first little jobs was moving stuff around and helping him. Okay. You know, so it was just profound. That's and great. I think it wasn't in the movie Fast and Furious. That's all they, that was how a lot of them got started in the Absolutely. car racing with, with the low riders and Absolutely. so forth. I actually love that, the whole entire seven series. Mm -hmm. I love Absolutely. those car movies. But um, so, and then that developed into a business or? Yeah, Absolutely. A lot of the business was out of people's backyards. Low riding okay. was like a backyard hobby mm -hmm. at the time. There was probably like 3,000 low riders, you know, low riders running around Compton, L.A. and Watts and probably four shops in various people's backyards. Mm. Okay. So I was one of the first to say, you know what, I'm going to open up a business and try to do this legally thing, you know. Yeah. Cause I learned a little bit about business licensing and renting <laughs> buildings and things like that. So mm -hmm. I did it and it was a success and I managed to go back and bring a lot of my friends out of the backyards as well. Mm. Wow. That's fantastic. Cause you know, at one time that uh, the urban league had a program where they were doing automobile uh, mechanic, mm -hmm. mechanic mm -hmm. uh, training. In fact, it was right there on Crenshaw when you're heading up to, um, I think this, uh, uh, what is that? Um, stalker. It's right there. They used to own that building, and it was an auto mechanic training center. 
That's that's very important because I, I graduated from Centennial High School from an auto mechanic class, and I always tell people I probably would have dropped out of school had it not been for that auto mechanic class. Mm, that's true. You know, they made that my very last class, mm -hmm. and that was actually the first class I ever got an A in. Mm. And, and it's interesting how the, the trades are an important factor, mm -hmm. and they were removed from our school. Absolutely. But a lot of our uh, parents, that's where they got those skill sets yes, because yes, a trade becomes a business. Absolutely. Um, well, absolutely. well, you just Becca. mentioned Jamaica, and that's what we did back in Jamaica. Uh, when you go to school, you're going to learn the high power classes, accounting, and physics, and all of that. But you got to also learn about auto mechanic. Yep. You got to learn about welding. You got to learn about all these other crafts, these technical crafts. Yes, because we never know when we're going to need to gravitate towards that. And that's why, that's why a lot of us today, we know a little bit about auto mechanics. We know a little bit about welding. Yep. We know a little bit Absolutely. about uh, uh, air conditioning, all Absolutely. of those things. And, Absolutely. you know, we need to that. We, know, we need to know that. So Absolutely. more power to you, my brother. Thank so you. were there is any entrepreneurs in your family? Absolutely it is. Okay. I was told that my family is one of the wealthiest families in America. Oh, yeah? It's called the Watkins family from Alabama. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. Uh, one of my uncle's cousins tried to buy the rent, was it, the Dodgers before McCourt bought it. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and then they protested, said, he's not even in Forbes magazine. Oh, man. Uh, I, wow. I, I, yeah, so I said, well, if that's the case, then why don't, uh, why is they even talking with him? Mm -hmm. You know, right. he wouldn't even be at the table if he didn't yeah. have the money. Yeah. Wow. So that so it's in your DNA. Yeah, it, it definitely and is. Now, were, as a young boy, though, did you not know about the family? And yeah, I, I knew that my family on the East Coast family was very wealthy. <laughs> and the West Coast family was job oriented. <laughs> <laughs> See, and that's where the, we got to come together on that, <laughs> right? Is to absolutely. teach and expose well, our children. Well, you know, there are two types of people out there, right? You got employees and, and you got entrepreneurs. Right. right? So absolutely. you got the employer and the employee and you <laughs> need both right. of them to make it work. Um, so I work, so you became quite successful in the automobile and was Absolutely. that the platform because I know you're into land development. Absolutely. And so is that how you acquired the money to become your own investor? Well, at sort the, of, so to speak. It started at the, at, yes, the yeah, so cars is where the money came from. Okay. Meaning I had a lot, of, because when I started building these cars, a lot of people globally were seeing these videos, you know, with all the rappers and lowriders, and they were like, we want one of those cars, you know. Right. So they would call down to Compton and say, well, I was in Gardena at the time, uh -huh. and say, hey, I want to buy some of those cars. And I'm like, now I'm buying a lot of cars, and I'm okay. shipping them from all over the country because California, America is where General Motors is the birthplace. Right, exactly. So we have cars hitting all in the hills and people's backyards mm -hmm. and, and barns. So fast forward the story. I started bringing these cars back like 30, 40, 50 a week or month, and I didn't have anywhere to keep them. Mm. So I started, someone recommended, hey, you should buy some land in Palmdale. Mm. Oh. Move all those cars, because at one time I had over 200 cars probably. That oh, is such wow. a smart yeah. move. Wow. That is such a smart move. Yeah, so I picked up a piece of land in the middle of nowhere yeah. with, with a fence around the it. The tax base is really low. Right. You know, so I paid about what? Uh, five hundred dollars for one, one fifteen hundred for another one, and then I got like thirty cars on this one, fifty on that one. I got tow trucks on this one, you mm, know. Mm, mm. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the development started. Uh -huh. A lot of people didn't realize that in two thousand two to two thousand six, yeah. Palmdale was the fastest growing city That's in America. True. That is true. Wow. Which led to developers mm -hmm. coming out there building mm -hmm. brand. We got a brand new Walmart. Yep. We got a brand new Staples. We got mm -hmm. a brand new Circuit City. We That's got a brand true. new. It was just out of control. So they kept coming to me saying, hey, we want to buy that land. Wow. Oh. We know you pay 1500 for it. We'll give you 50 for it. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I got a hundred cars on that lot. Like, no. <laughs> you know, it's, That's it's not, not enough worth money it. yet. It's, it's not worth it, you know. So Fast forward the story, I started seeing all this development, and I remember seeing uh, these houses were being built. And, and I just realized, I said, wait a minute. They gave me, you know, a lot of money, way, a hundred times what I paid for it. Mm -hmm. And then they put this big mall on it, and they put this shopping center, and they put a Staples, and they put, I'm like, wait a minute, what if I'd have kept that land? land. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And built my own shopping center, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how it, it got started. So I started building houses, and it just blew up. I started building one, then I realized it was cheaper to build two, then mm -hmm. I learned the game, then I started building three and four. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to Los Angeles, and people were like, we're flipping. I'm like, really? 
Flipping. <laughs> like, what's that? <laughs> flipping. Y'all ain't making no money. You know, they're like, oh, we making money. You can't tell me anything. I'm right. Like, okay. <laughs> but you got rent coming in. Yeah. You, you know, and and, and so, right, because it's ongoing. It's, yeah. it's, it's the multi, the streams of income coming yeah, in, not the one lump sum. Right. You, the flippers will flip one house a year. Right. Because it's so difficult to find houses. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. how many houses are you flipping? Right. Like, how much did you make? Oh, mm-hmm. you made 50 grand. He's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, we we're making three and four hundred per house. Yeah. And building, if we wanted to build 50, we can build 50. Yeah. Right. If we wanted to build 200, we can build right. 200. Unlimited sources. We were hiring friends and family, and now they're building. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, that that's that will make a great segue into the next sec- question that I have. Now, I mentioned earlier about many of our small businesses leasing from landlords right. and right. and right. then when they fix up the place, dress it up because it was really crappy when they got it. Right. They fix it up. Then all of a sudden the landlord go, oh, got to go. Yep. I need my place. So now they can sell it or rent it out for much higher. How do you view that and how, you know, what words of wisdom do you have for some of these entrepreneurs who are involved in that? You know, that's interesting you say that because I started teaching a lot of workshops Mm -hmm. about that same topic. Mm -hmm. And actually, March 5th, I'll be in Arizona at a hair show, Mm -hmm. a natural hair show, teaching them about protecting, about purchasing the land and building buildings. Because a lot of our hair industry, Mm -hmm. the barbers and the beauty salons, they're moving every three and four years. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not just them, but all the black businesses. Exactly. I don't have to tell you guys about Crenshaw. I know you know. Yeah. But I, I recommend that. We do not lease buildings Mm -hmm. if we don't have to. We can afford to buy. Let's buy. Can you say that again, please? (laughs) Do not do not lease buildings because most, especially reason why is most of these people know that uh, the metro is coming. They're going to be able to sell it soon, Mm -hmm. so they're putting people on month to month leases Mm -hmm. or one year leases. I recommend if you can't get a ten year lease, Mm -hmm. don't accept anything less than three Mm -hmm. because that three years will will fly. That's what I'm talking about. so we got to start. I'm teaching people to come together. So we're, we're for example, we're you t- you have a radio station. Mm-hmm. I have a, a, a teaching class, mm-hmm. and she has a beauty salon. Mm-hmm. Well, let's come together and buy this building. That's what I'm right. talking about. Exactly. You know? So we don't we don't conflict with each, with, with each other. Yes. So exactly. this is how it's going to work for us. I love that. I love that concept because that's what I've been trying to preach for years yeah. to small businesses because they really don't get it and. By ourselves, we really can't go out and purchase these properties. We got to collaborate, like you're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And then on another note, how I started opening up multiple businesses is I started noticing I had my first shop in Gardena, California, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I started noticing my receipts all said Palmdale, Lancaster, Lake LA, Mm -hmm. Hesperia, Mm -hmm. and I'm like, where where is this? You know. (laughs) So I'm like, I'm looking at it, and it's like 60 percent of my income is coming from this. Exactly. This place here. So what I so I realized I said maybe I should open up another location out there uh-huh. and I can make some money. Yeah. Because if they're driving all the way from Palmdale to Gardena, then mm-hmm. maybe I need to make sure yep. that they keep coming to me. So yep. I opened up a second location. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Smartest thing I ever Beautiful. did. So I encourage people to Rent is high here in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. but when you go to Palmdale, I think my shop there, I had a huge shop yep. for five hundred dollars a month. That's what I'm talking Where about. I was paying fifteen hundred here. And that wasn't big enough. This but, is amazing. So, so I encourage and I teach people when I'm coaching, I say, look, I know you want to have the biggest beauty salon in Inglewood, yeah. but you're paying 4000 a month. Mm-hmm. 60% of your clients live in Palmdale, Paris, California, and all these other places. But So why don't you just scale back from the big one, mm-hmm. get a smaller one here, and get two or three locations elsewhere. Right. And now you can start selling these as a franchise. And end up having maybe a thousand one day. And instead of your co- instead of your the bulk of your revenues going towards cost of goods sold, it goes towards your profit right. in your pocket. Absolutely. Your pocket. You see what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Because if, if you're generating rent uh, revenue is say five thousand, but your rent is four thousand, that's four thousand cost of goods sold right there. Absolutely. Yeah, you're you're only making a thousand. But yeah. if you can if you can flip that. You know, and, <laughs> go ahead. I don't. I don't want to plug this movie, but I got to bring it up to you guys. <laughs> Have you seen the movie The Founder? No, no. It was a story. That's the one. That's the one about McDonald's. Absolutely. I gotta see it. Oh, I gotta profound. see it. 
It shows that the guy was not making any money, even yeah. though he had dozens of McDonald's. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when they turned around and said, you should buy the land mm -hmm. that the McDonald's sit on, mm -hmm. you're not about selling burgers. You, you should buy the land. land. Exactly. Oh, in man. fact, in all of our Watch classes, the movie. Yeah. Watch the I got to see it. I got to see it. I'm like... That's why every time a movie like that come out, they'll put yeah. out a black movie on the same day. Uh -huh. And we're going to go see the black movie. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I'm like, we got to see these oh, movies yeah. because it shows that they didn't put anything into these business startups. See, that's right. pearl of wisdom. Yeah. And I don't remember where I was last week. We were talking about the same concept. You know, someone says, do you know why it's important to know where a McDonald's is being built? They're going, I don't care about that. Yes, you should care. Yeah, absolutely. Because McDonald's, they build on their own land, yep. and wherever they build, there's a lot of people going there. It yep. makes the property, Absolutely. your property value go up. Absolutely. So that's where you want to be. Right. And these are things that <laughs> And actually, in, our, in, in my entrepreneurial classes, uh, that was in marketing classes and your MBA classes. That's what you talk about. Yes. You don't talk about McDonald's yeah. being a burger place. You mm. talk about Mark, McDonald's being in business. He's in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. There, he is not yeah. in the burger place. Yeah, absolutely. And and he's in the real estate business all over the world. Oh yeah. And and, and they just happen to be a product that they put on their land. Right. Mm -hmm. And had nothing to do with burgers. That's why there's no <laughs> fanta. And but here, and that makes sense as to why they're having some issues now because land has become very scarce oh, yeah. in the United States, yeah. right? Mm. Well, that's what they tell us anyway. But not at all. And actually, um, uh, TJ, I was at a forum. It was called How the Housing Our Workers Forum, and you actually should have been there. I'm going to make sure that you meet the uh, Mel Wilson who was on our show last week, because the we we were there in the valley, and our conversation was. Um, the the housing situation crisis here because we have not enough inventory for the number of people that are actually living, and this is around the country, but m mainly we're talking in Los Angeles, and that rents are so expensive, and so many people are homeless, and so forth and so on. So that was the conversation, and it was well. He had a, an amazing turnout. He's been in real estate for the last fifty years. And uh, so the question we were asked, and I sat on the panel, and one of the questions was, how did we get here? And then the second question was, and it was an input from those of us on the panel, those that were uh, esteemed real estate professionals, uh, those that were in the governmental entities, and those that sat with all the national, the NAR and, and the real estate associations and, D and DRA. But uh, they are, and the second question was, how do we move from here and be successful in creating housing for uh, both units as well as single family homes because the way it's going right now we have units but in five years those families that are going to be in the units are going to have families and children and in mm -hmm. multiple children mm -hmm. and living in an apartment is not going to be conducive to yeah. a lot and then the children will have parks and play and grass and all that sort of stuff so then we'll be back here again in five years because we have to figure out where we're going to put single family homes. Mm -hmm. So um, and then the final question was, how do we work together collaboratively? And that's why it will be great for you to have that conversation and to meet with Mel is how do we work as a collaboration to develop? Because the foreign investors are coming in with cash yes. that make it very, yes. very difficult. There is nothing even resembling an affordable housing anymore because they're foreign and they bring in their own money. Mm -hmm. So they're not under any um, government governmental regulations. Or right whatever. to add in affordable housing, mm -hmm. and you have people that are making ten dollars an hour, and they can't afford seventeen hundred dollars. Or in L in the South LA, it's actually uh, twenty three hundred dollars actually to have a one bedroom apartment wow. in LA if you want to live here. And then the other question was having to live way out and then drive or way out, and, and there's no job. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that was what that was a conversation that we had, and there's several articles I'll send it because he had the Daily News there, and it was on the radio and the whole bit. I the think whole... I think both him and Mel would make a good team. Yeah, I think so. I think so. When you meet him, it, and he's connected, you know, oh, he's well, very connected. Well, well connected. So, mm, so okay, this well, will be definitely. good for you. You know, spread the wealth, man. <laughs> Well, I would definitely control like to... more spaces. That's what you need. And to actually, do. I heard that after the the um, after Inglewood, uh, the next growth area again is the Palmdale, Lancaster, the Inland yeah. Empire because yeah. of Amazon, or at least mm -hmm. it was. See, 
See, that's the, I hope I don't go wrong, go into something wrong with you guys, but we are under a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's true. Palmdale and Lancaster is fastly developing mm -hmm. to the point that it's so expensive that mm -hmm. they're pushing the Palmdale residents to California, California. City. Mm -hmm. oh, so, these, okay. so I know a, a lot of cities that we've never heard of before mm -hmm. that we need that that tons of plenty of land yeah for as far as the eye can yeah. see yeah yeah you know we, we're not running out of land no. in fact when you jump on an airplane you you barely see lights down yeah. there so what do you yeah. mean we're running out of light? <laughs> come on now let's You're think right. about it i You're guess right. it just depends got... on where you want to live right. but i know so, vegas was the same way and now everywhere. vegas has been yeah. every there's no, there. see this is why we have to have a a, a manufacturing i'm sorry not a manufacturing but a, a, a land my land development classes mm -hmm. because we have to think like developers. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you learn to think like a developer, your whole perspective of the world changes. That's true. You see things totally different. That is true. When you're driving down the street, you're like, wait a minute. This You start noticing yeah, things. Yeah. When you're thinking about stuff and people start having conversations, you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Developers drive the world. Mm -hmm. So if I start talking about things, it, it just change your whole perspective mm -hmm. so it's very critical that we start teaching our children at a very young age mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. development just like me i learned because of all the crime was going on like your mom would say hey i need you to uh, go over across the street in the other neighborhood mm -hmm. and get me some swabs from thrifties well guess what that's the wrong neighborhood now he's mm -hmm. gonna get shot mm -hmm. so some of the guys in my neighborhood they bought 10 parcels of land mm -hmm. and they said all in our neighborhood and we're gonna build 10 burger stands, 10 beauty salons, 10 barber shops, 10 one hour photos. That kind of show you the date now. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're going to build all of these things and get some jobs so we won't have to worry about people getting shot. Mm -hmm. So at nine years old, I found out what blueprints were. Mm -hmm. I got to learn how to read the blueprints. Okay. Because I was a nine year old with a million and a half questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how the yeah. young people come oh, in right. and be like, will you leave me alone and go watch TV? Yeah. Right, exactly. Now, there wasn't no TV back then. Yeah. There wasn't nothing yeah. to watch. So <laughs> they was like, well, just answer his questions. And yeah. He explained to me, this is what the blueprints are. Yeah. This is what some land is. This mm -hmm. is what development is. This is what construction is. This is So I learned all of that. Wow. So from 9 to 13, or what was it, 12 or 13, I watched some strip malls going up. Yeah. Mm. And then I remember telling the guy, I said, we're reading the blueprints, and I'm, the guy says he's, he's finished, and he needs them to sign off on it, my buddy to sign off. And I'm looking, and I'm like, well, that's not right. He's like, why? I said, in the drive through People are going to get jacked because you can't get out of there. That's true. And then the guy started laughing, like, get out of here with that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then my buddy said, wait a minute. No, he's right. He's right. Re redesign that. He said, that's going to cost you a lot of money. He said, redesign it. Yeah. We don't need that to be locked in. And next thing you know, he said, from now on, you work with TJ. Mm -hmm. I'm like 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, amazing. So by the time I was 20 years old, I was running circles around wow. people because I can identify land. Wow. This is a good deal. That's wow. not a good deal. Okay. That's a great building. Let's buy that one. Don't touch that one. Yeah. And see, that's where it shows that be, being in a certain environment, it really builds your intellect. Right. You see what I right. mean? Absolutely. Because if you weren't in certain environment, that's why I share with people right now in, in Crystal, whenever we go to a restaurant, you know, I sit a certain place in the rest. I'm not sitting with my back to the door. Right. There's a reason right. for that. Right. You see what right. I'm saying? You want to see. And that's because of my environment. Right. You see what you I'm want saying? To see what's right. going on. So, right. so those in. those are things. Just like you're pointing right. out with the building. Just, just like right now, we got people's the dominant conversation in our community is, "Oh my God, the prices are so expensive. Oh, I'm moving to Atlanta. I'm moving to Texas." But when I go into my, my wife friends' communities, they're like, oh, my God, we're, how do we get to Watts? I got to go get some of that land, you know? And I'm like, dude, you just came from Italy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What do you know about Watts? Yeah. You know? They're like, oh, that's where, we, that's where the investments are. So yeah. we have people coming from yeah. all around oh, the yeah. world oh, yeah. looking for Compton. Because they're you know? hearing about yes. it. Yes. They're so, hearing about it. So even at my friends, uh, here's another thing. We got, a, we, got two, we're, we got this big divide. We got people saying, oh, black people don't have this and they don't have that and they're not doing this. And then we got the people over here that's doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they don't know each other. Yeah. They don't even talk. They yeah. don't communicate. Right, exactly. Because these people over here are too smart. They're all educated. Yeah. You got right, degrees. Right, right. And you can't tell them anything. Yeah. Yeah. So these people over here, they're just living it and doing it. Yeah. So, for example, my buddy at Tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum, you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. He's over there. People coming in there. 
Europeans coming in and he's flying them around over the city and they're like, okay, take us to fly over Compton. <laughs> oh, we're flying. I'm like, I never realized just how much development is happening. Mm-hmm. So we're not, when was the last time you drove through Watts? Yeah. When was the last time you drove yeah. through Compton every, yeah. every I block? Compton a couple weeks ago. I went to a funeral. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, we, go, we go straight yeah. in and, and get straight out. out. Yeah, exactly. But when I'm flying over and I'm looking down, all I see is brand new wood and construction mm-hmm. oh, yeah. and, and concrete Opportunities. trucks. It's so much development yeah. that we don't see it. Yes. We don't know. Well, we definitely want to continue this because I'm getting inspired here right now. So it's now 4.30. I think we're going to go ahead and take another break. Felicia, it's a, take a two-minute break, and uh, we'll come right back to this. And, Crystal, you've got some vital information that I want you to weave into this conversation. All right. Sounds okay. good to me. All right. So we'll take a break, Crystal. Okay. Meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30 day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186. So we're back on the business zone. We're having a great conversation here, Crystal and our guests. And Mr. Laughlin, uh, just lead us back into this. You've got some great information that you want to share with us some more. And so I'm going to lead kind of in because, um, you know, TJ was able to take, he was able to use one platform to jump off to another platform. Mm -hmm. And you actually had the the benefit of being exposure 
to both of your industries that you that you become successful in and and you were inquisitive and i think that was that's a key, oh yeah mm-hmm. key oh, factor yeah. right there is right. that you ask questions and you just and and obviously to be in land development and to be observant is is important because Absolutely. a lot of times we don't see the opportunities and they're sitting right up underneath us underneath our eyes right. um but we don't see it it's not laid out all pretty and wrapped up in a ribbon so therefore there are no opportunities right Mm -hmm. and so and you also reached out to collaborate with other people now those are all key factors to being successful Mm -hmm. and to changing the current paradigm because gilbert and i uh, you know we meet and you're a coach as well so you you get it when you're in a class i know you get the same thing so when you bring these innovative ideas and people kind of look at you blankly and they're looking at you like you're a superhero because you didn't done something miraculous to them absolutely which is not miraculous really at all at it's all. just at all. you were inquisitive you research you right. you identified an opportunity and you found out how you could get involved in that opportunity he was persistent about it and, and he, he was persistent through. and determined Whereas a lot of our business owners are not, you know, they kind of some of the stuff just kind of falls into their lap Mm -hmm, and -hmm. and, and then they don't venture out and and, and to find out what else where here I am right now. And so for you, from what I'm getting from this conversation, you are already looking out five, 10 years, Mm -hmm. 10, 20 years, 10, 20 years where most of us. So when you say, no, there's not a problem because you're already 20 years out. right? Right. Most people are still right now. Mm-hmm. There, there is actually a problem, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Okay. We're worried about some bubble, but the reality is they're trying to convince us to sell. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's why you look on TV and you see flip, 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 flip yeah. this house, flip yeah. this. Yeah. Flipping Tennessee, flipping Palmdale, flipping yeah. L.A. It's all about selling, selling, selling. Yeah. But the reality is real estate is a sit-and-hold item. Mm-hmm. Is a sit-and-hold. Is it a long-term but investment? It's a long-term investment. Mm-hmm. And back in 2002 to 2006, there was nothing in L.A. to justify it. Four hundred thousand dollar houses. Right, right. Yeah. So now, or seven hundred thousand, whatever it was here. Right. Palmdale went from a hundred mm-hmm. for a big giant house to right. five hundred and a million. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> right, so exactly. there was nothing, no jobs to justify that. But yeah. guess what? Now we have Google, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, uh, Belkin, right. Yahoo, Amazon. All of these billion and trillion dollar corporations mm-hmm. surrounding us, and they're pushing the real estate yeah, values up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's what people are not paying attention to. So, right. what I'm, t- what I'm, it's important that we educate people and let them know that in the next three years, you're going to be a millionaire if you own a home. If you own a home, if, if you don't if sell, you sit in home. <laughs> right? Why is that? Because. What happened in uh, in Alta Vista was it Alta? What is it where where, where Facebook and everybody is? Oh, right up north. Yeah, yeah right up, up the there in the Bay, um, Bay Area. Palo, Palo, Alto. Palo Alto. Palo Alto, Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Yeah. Palo Alto yeah. is what happened in Palo Alto is so many corporations, billion dollar corporations, were there that they pushed the cost of living up through the roof, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. their employees could not afford to live across the street. Right. Right. So they 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 with one point two million for a seven hundred square foot loft. Yeah. Right. So they decided, you know, we need to move mm-hmm. because all our people live in Palo deal hypothetically speaking yeah, right and every time their child gets sick they can't come to work yeah right so we need to move somewhere affordable right. so where is that place affordable at mm-hmm. santa monica right. los angeles right. you know you look in heart the torrent we got ferrari just put opened up yeah. maserati's two uh-huh. doors down yeah. porsche dealership mm-hmm. they're getting they're getting prepared so they're going to push the prices of real estate further through the roof. Mm-hmm. So we need to start preparing people to keep the houses and what to do with the money when they get the money. Yeah, right. Because yeah. they will have the money, trust me. Right. I've mm-hmm. seen this happen in Palmdale. Everybody became a millionaire overnight and all of a sudden they start making these crazy purchases yeah. mm-hmm. and went broke two years Just later. Because later. Yeah. if we come back, that that comes down to the financial literacy and not understanding money and, and thinking money is just to spend right away because they've right. never learned the value of investment. Right. Uh, that was not something that was ex- exposed to many of us. And if we didn't see it in, in our homes. And then the other thing I think is a lot of times depending on your age bracket, probably not as much as your age group, but in my age group, and I'm sure in Gwen's and Walter's, uh, we parents didn't talk about finances. Nope. They didn't tell you how much they made. They didn't tell you what their assets were, or even you didn't even know if they owned the house. Right. Well, right. we didn't even know what assets were. We didn't know what assets, assets were. Assets and liabilities. So you didn't, didn't know that. get, and, and, and Walter and, and Gwen are both in the financial industry, but those are some of the challenges that we had is that we never 
And it was purpose. It was by design. Absolutely. We didn't understand or still today understand the true value of money. Absolutely. Because if we did, our $1.2 trillion that we are, as a consumer, would have a lot more value to us and we would get it. When I say that, those in the room that understand money go, whoa, that's a lot of money. Those that don't understand, they're like, but I got to have my tennis shoes. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to have that. Not understanding the power of that dollar right. and, and how that speaks volumes and how it changes your paradigm of how people uh, interact with you. And that's why those numbers that you have right there is going to speak directly to that. It will. Or, or lack thereof. Or, or lack thereof. <laughs> so I, I, I'm participating in Recycling Black Dollars myself, and, and there's a number. So there, there's been an undercurrent going on in Los Angeles, and it really kind of constituted out of what was happening up and down Crenshaw. Because a lot of our businesses, there are like 300 and something businesses along Crenshaw at the beginning of the construction, and there's a half of that or less than a half of that right. now because, right. one, they didn't own their buildings. Uh, one, they didn't have uh, – they couldn't tell you how much money they made because they weren't keeping financial right. records and right. none of that sort of stuff. They just weren't running their businesses. It was cash and carry you know, because you had a lot of barbers, a lot of beauticians, and a lot of on-demand cash kind of businesses. So that, biz- that money wasn't going into banks. It was being spent beforehand or wherever they were doing with it, but uh, nothing that could help them buy that building because they didn't have any financial records. So um, there's an initiative that uh, was put in place, and, and it started in Baltimore. is a partnership between Milken Institute and the Small Business Administration. Now, there's been several occasions where they had talked about redefining and, and reclassifying and uh, the how the Small Business Association provides loans to, to minority-owned businesses. Uh, it has never been done. And I think that goes all the way back to Reagan, to the Reagan era. So Milken uh, and the small business, they, they've created a joint effort and they're joined together to create practical recommendations to increase the lending to the underserved marketplace. That's the black and the brown. And so we've been having these forums. We launched in October to have conversations about what does how do we change what is going on with us finding loans? So they'll provide a loan for us for we can get um, secured credit cards. We can get mortgages. We can get car loans. But the one loan that is very elusive is the business loan. Mm-hmm. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, a, a house loan, if you go get buy a house and you have the income, you can buy a house that's almost a million dollars. If you have two incomes that are making X amount of dollars, right? And that's for a 30-year loan. But it has nothing to do with you creating legacies because that's your home. That's not an investment, and it's still owned by the bank, so they can take it whenever they want to. So they've brought this together. So we've been sitting down uh, having—we've had a couple of task force meetings. Uh, It's broken down into several sectors, the lending marketplace, the— the emerging sectors, which is the small business and existing businesses, and we need to change what's going on out there. So there were some numbers that um, that were given to us, and this meeting took place yesterday on on the seventh on my, on Tuesday, and uh, I know what the deal is, and I've been involved in a lot of meetings. But when I heard these numbers, I was like, oh my god! It felt like somebody had just stabbed me in the heart. So when they look at the under under uh, presented uh, marketplace with the black and the brown, uh, there are the population, we make up 13% of that. And the Hispanic population makes up really 16 or 17% of the population of of the United States. Business-wise, the number of black-owned firms, and this is coming from the 2012 census, census. was is 109,000 small businesses. And in the United yeah. States, hundred and what? Uh, one hundred and nine thousand black-owned wow. firms that, that they classified as small employer. That firms. is small. That is super small. And in the Hispanic, they're slightly bigger. Now, total firms, there's five million. So we are one. We are represent two percent of that. But you know what? They're, that, those are to me. That's inaccurate. 
Yeah, based is. on the fact that that's not counting internet businesses. Yeah. Well, and, and again, yeah. so so when eBay, we when we heard Amazon, exactly, yeah. but but when we heard this, so this is the question was there are a lot. I mean, because they were saying this is just census data. Mm-hmm. Right. So for the bl- uh, black and the brown, we're not very trusting, mm-hmm. uh, and we weren't giving you accurate information anyway, which is why we knew what transpired on Crenshaw because they're not going to give that information unless they have a relationship with you and feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Enough to divulge that, and in the, in the Hispanic marketplace, you know, there's there's like five point about seven percent of the employer owned. Now there are tons of self-employed, sole proprietor, no employee businesses. Mm-hmm. There, but there for those that have more than two two to three employees where they're paying payroll is a very small percentage. Because if, even if you have your online businesses, it's usually just one person. You're not really hiring anybody. Or paying payroll, where it's going into a payroll system. That's where these numbers were generated from. Well, see, to me, they're they're trying to give us some false goal. We don't well, ha- no. we don't have this, so that's not a business. When the reality is, is the world is changing, and people are sitting home, laying in their bed on their smartphone, making six figures a year. Right, and that's you know? and that's the, and that's, that's the purpose what... of this initiative because they brought in different people from different areas. So. A big area or a big demographics that we're tr- we are working with is the millennials. Mm-hmm. And those millennials are the ones that do that kind of right. business. So there's right. a guy, and you probably know his, well, I've heard of him. His name is Mike Muse. He, um, he's an entertainer. He's uh, big in, in, the, in the music industry. But he is now working, he works with the SBA. He partners with their SBA, and he actually works for My Brother's Keeper. And so they're reaching out to the millennials, and that's what we need to do, though. But again, bottom line is it comes down to capital. Because if, if, if they didn't have the wherewithal that you have, have had, most of our small businesses don't have the access to the capital or they don't know they have the access to the capital in order to grow their businesses to a place where they can hire 10, 15, 20 employees. You got into manufacturing. How many manufacturers, how many people have you spoken to that don't even think that manufacturing is on the table for them? A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people outside of my industry. Outside of your industry. But in my industry, it's normal. Right, exactly. For, for the 22-year-old guy to be, yeah, I make these hydraulic parts now. Right, and that's where we need to be is right. creating manufacturing opportunities. And creating access and, and, to and, it. And access to yeah. those, right? And, I, and I, I saw from your website that you have a lot of those type of classes right. and so right. forth. But we need to bring you into our circle because when I'm having these conversations with the individuals, that is not even something on the radar. Because even even some of what Crystal is talking, though some of those numbers she's talking about, she hasn't even gotten to the point where the number of minority businesses who've gotten loans, how small that is, right? Or opportunities for their business. You see what I mean? Right. And I, I don't I don't have a problem with them not giving people loans because most people who ask who who get loans don't know what to do with the money and don't need that much in the first place. Yeah. So I look at. Facebook started with one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Apple computer started with less than fifteen hundred. I'm sorry, Facebook was less than fifteen hundred. Apple was one thousand two hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. I started with five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and I can just keep going on and on. In fact, I think I gave a. I didn't think I gave a. Uh, there was a meeting, and I was speaking, and I asked the whole room. I said, "Room full of business owners." I said. How many of you guys, and I was using college tuition, mm-hmm. how many of you guys had $300,000 when you started your business? <laughs> whole room laughed at me. Yeah. 160, still mm-hmm. laughing. 50, still mm-hmm. laughing. Mm-hmm. We didn't get down to 10%, I mean to 10,000 before I started seeing the majority of the room's hands go up. Yeah. And how many of the room people in here are millionaires? Half the room. Mm. So we're asking for the wrong thing. So we got people coming in. I need $50,000. I'm like, what do you need $50,000 for? Mm-hmm. Oh, I need to buy some vans and I got to have some money for... And I'm like, you've never had a business, so why are you going to go into debt before you get started? Mm -hmm. Why don't you make some money first and let that money pay for the next thing that you need? Mm -hmm. In the car industry, someone comes to me. And that's another thing. I see people come in and say, okay, I'm going to get this deal. So uh, Crystal wants to do business with me, and she says she wants to buy a 1,000 of my new phone cases. So I'm going to go run to the bank and ask to borrow $50,000 so I can make those phone cases. 
But when the reality is, if Crystal wants to buy these, Crystal needs to give me a deposit on these. Mm -hmm. Well, that's That's true. what that's eBay true. said. That's what eBay is based on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's where we go wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. But those are that that's the the new on demand and a lot of our and we pretty much deal with not the millennial. We're dealing with more established team uh, business owners that have they only know one way. And, and right. so that's being able to open up their mind, eyes to see out of the box thinking. Right. But uh, you were exposed to out of the box thinking. I'm an out of the box thinker. He is definitely an out of the box thinker. But majority of and and, and Gilbert's marketplace is mostly the Hispanic population. Yeah. Mine's is more us. And so he sees the same trends mm -hmm. in both areas. Yeah. So somewhere the training or the opportunities, the SBA, the, and that's some of the things that we're talking. Talking, right. the, the car it's not the right conversation that's being right. had mm -hmm. right. so that we can get the information out because if you did what you did with manufacturing that's where we need to be focusing on absolutely right absolutely. not and and those of our businesses that find it's easy to go into a service-based business because you don't need any money but can we take those individuals and move them into manufacturing there's always a need. And now, because it's, we live in a global world, you don't have to just manufacture for here. Nope. You can manufacture and send that to another continent. Right. And Africa is like a melting pot of Absolutely. opportunities Absolutely. because your rubber tires is not over there. Right. Your covers are not over no. there. Yeah. Right. They, they yeah. need everything that we take for granted over mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. right. They need it over there. Yeah. Right. And and that's how I did very well in the low riding industry because I started shipping cars to Japan, Germany, Australia, New Zealand. And then they started calling me saying, hey, well, when we're driving our low riders, what do I wear? You know, what kind of, what kind of hat? You know? And I'm like, uh, you, you got to have a hat to say Compton on. They're like, yeah. oh, send me a container. <laughs> oh! You know, and then I'm like, then I realized I'm like, wait a minute, they don't know. I'm loving this. So let me. So that's why I started the clothing line back in the day. They said, I said, oh, they wearing these shirts that we got. They said, what kind? And I'm like, um, <laughs> oh, it's a shirt with a with a rim on it. And they like send me a container. And then I'm like, Crystal, who makes shirts? You know? and, and that's how the business started. I need oh, you yeah. to send me this much money. Oh, yeah. and, and so this is why it's important. Then I realized I made more money overseas than yeah, I did here. That's right. right. That's exactly. right. Way more. So that's they were right. excited. So money never slows down. Yeah. It changes places. It changes yeah. places, and that's yeah. what we have to get. At. I am definitely going to, because we're doing, um, We I do a business count with kids every year. Mm -hmm. uh, they're from the ages, technically from the age of 14 to 18, but we have a couple of 10-year-olds in there because they've been doing stuff. I would love to have you come out and talk to the kids when that happens, because when when I have our orientation, that's what I'm talking to the children about. I want, if you're going to do t-shirt, t-shirts, I want t-shirts on a huge level. Right. I, I want uh, jewelry on a large level. I don't want small stuff that that is not going to make you any money, no more than lunch money. And to know that you can start this business today. You know, and, and, and that's what's important is I would like, I'm, I'm working currently to expose my industry. I stepped out of my industry I'm like the Michael Jordan who decided, I don't want to play basketball anymore. I'm going to go play baseball. <laughs> okay. So people are looking at me crazy. Like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're the Steve Jobs of the low-riding industry. Now you right. want to go do something, this public speaking thing. <laughs> and I'm like, but what's happening is in my industry, we got more people, since it's grown to like over 10 million cars worldwide, mm -hmm. we got more people coming here looking for the work to be done and don't have the people to do the work. Mm. So we so need to get the we people. Need painters, we need mechanics, we need auto body guys, we need guys to do fabrication, people who know how to weld. We don't have these things. So what people under, fail to understand is I don't want my baby touching the lowrider and things like that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Low riding has hydraulics in it. Mm -hmm. It has mechanic in it. It right. has auto body. We're talking about pathways mm -hmm. to leading to, to other you things. To Nolan Rollins, the president of the Urban League, because he's that's the kind of innovation yeah, I I that know. you know. Shorter no, ball head thin. He's tall. Okay. He's yeah, tall. No, no, yeah, he's tall. Okay. So you need to meet because that's what Nolan. He is that kind of guy, and and nobody comes to the table with that kind. Of, nobody I know, and I you can attest is having this conversation that you're having wow. right now. Nobody. That's why when you speak to people, they're like, what's he talking about? Because mm -hmm. nobody's mm -hmm. having this conversation, TJ. He's yeah, he's making it up. up see, he's see TJ, he's the, the thing is, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm just 
enamored right now because that's why I'm sitting here quiet listening because a lot of what you're saying are some of the things I've been saying for a while now, but you're taking it to another level. And this is just food to my stomach right now. You see what I'm saying? I am loving this. And it's a shame that we only have two hours on this show to do this. I would have <laughs> wished we had five we more hours. Come on back out. Oh, so we, we got to have you back. More we got to have you back. Because yeah. th- what you're saying a lot of key things that entrepreneurs really need to hear. Right. Because, you know, in talking about the investments and funding and all of those, those are key areas that need to be explored. And, and, and let's talk about that really fast. We get to a situation. If I say, hey, Jonathan's, Jonathan's going to college. Everybody's writing checks. Yeah. But if I say Jonathan has a great idea for an app, people are like, yeah, yeah, go to college. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. He only needs six thousand dollars. Exactly. And the app could possibly sell to Apple for a billion. That's right. what I'm talking you know, about. Exactly. And he could come back and buy up all of Little Mert Park yeah. in L.A. Yeah. and save the community. From and it's education. interesting because that conversation that you had when I've been there have been a number of kids that have come up with these amazing uh, uh, right. apps. And then I try to bring someone right. in to help them figure out how to. To, to scale that mm-hmm. and there's nobody that mm-hmm. in the, the core group of people yeah. and some of these people are in technology yeah. and they, they're not us they're not our color and exactly. they and, and they and can't they'll, they'll maybe they don't want to tell our they children they definitely don't yeah. want and to so our children is still like how do I make money because these kids I had one kid and, and after he said that he actually won the competition but after he said it he wanted a bat he created a basketball app that will identify where a game was going at any given point in time and oh goodness, and this right. was several years ago. So then after that, there was tons of those apps no. out there. And then I told him, I said, why don't you then change that and add a component to the fantasy, like they have fantasy football, have fantasy basketball. You know what the biggest thing is that we need to be learning right now? Start teaching our kindergartners. Yes. we got to start teaching them about apps yeah. because it's no longer about gold and oil. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's about uh, apps, yeah. meaning about- uh, Candy Crush, for example, yeah. sold for five point nine billion dollars. Wow. Every time we get something more convenient for our cell phone, yeah. that's an app yeah. that somebody just bought yeah. for over probably eight hundred million and up. That's right. right, and it's normal yeah. for an app to sell for a billion dollars. So the new gold in yeah. oil yeah. is an idea. Is an right. idea, that's and an so- idea, and this is worth so much money. It's yeah. important that. That's why I say I've been in dealing with the Compton School District. I'm all on YouTube doing videos, and I'm talking to these kindergartners about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and intellectual property yeah. because they're going into our school systems, mm-hmm. coming up with video games. Yeah. How do, why don't you create your own game on yeah. our game? Yeah, and, and they're, they're playing. They that. own that. Yeah, they own, they own, own the it. game that these kids are creating. They own it yeah. exactly. And, and maybe what we can do then on that note, because you're this innovative thinker. Fine. There are grants out there for that. So we can do that under RBD and we can actually have classes for our kids beyond yeah. the NIFTY program. Because that's what I do, a certified NIFTY program. And we have to find funding to make that happen. And it's a 10 day camp every summer. But that needs to be ongoing. And I've actually gone into schools. We can create an after school program. And there's a, in fact, in fact, there's a guy that we're going to put a tennis program over at the uh, uh, Car- uh, Washington, Car- George Washington Carver Elementary okay. School in Compton. Okay, he wants me to bring something in. Wow, he's very innovative. They had a tennis court. We have already put the proposal in for the the um for the tennis program. He's ready to go. He just get the sign off from his board, and he and I told him about the entrepreneur program. He goes, "When you want to do it, just tell me what we need to do so we can sit down and put that together." Compton's your backyard, That's and this good. and and is next door to Willowbrook's Boys and Girls Club. Oh, I love it. And they have a relationship. I love it. And they are excited about that kind of stuff. I love it. This guy came in prison. He's got lacrosse. He got golf. He's mm. got tennis. He got swimming. They do ballet over at the Boys and Girls Club. Wow. So when I talked to him about the Entrepreneur Club, he said, yeah, let's do that. Mm. It's, it's neat. So let's talk about that, and we can start with him. I'm ready. Because he's open to that, but that's the kind of conversation we need to have. We got a couple well, of minutes. Well, definitely ready to have a conversation. Yeah, and we're going to have you back. And we don't want to act on it. We don't want to talk about yeah, it. That too long. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we're too long. exactly. We're doing stuff. exactly. We only have a minute left, yeah, so, so I don't do know. A, a shout out. Go I got to do a real shout out. I want to thank some friends of mine for participating in the partner, the the Plum, the partner lender, partnership lending in the underserved market. That was Miro Shabazz. Fantastic. 
fantastic job, Muriel. Thank you, Suzanne Summers. Thank you for stepping up and helping us out. Wileen, Wileen Winferl. Thank you so much for the donation for Recycling Black Dollars. We so appreciate it. We love you. And I also want to say a shout out to a mentor, a mentee of mine. Over the weekend, I went to her new boutique. It's called Designs on the Vine. She It was a concept two years ago. It is actual reality. She had told me, she goes, I am already got my expenses paid up until March, and I've, I'm at Beautiful boutique is in Temecula. Mm. Her and her husband moved from Los Angeles or Inglewood to mm. Temecula. Mm. I am so proud of you, Rosalind Balmore. Thank you so much for listening and being open to uh, the coaching that and the mentor and the mentorship that we pro- I provided for you, and listening to all of the other individuals that helped you make your dream a reality. And so I want to congratulate you on your store, and it's called Desi- Designs on the Vine. It's in Temecula, off of Yenez Road. She's also on um, line, and it's Divine Designs on the Vine dot com. So. That's what I got to say. With that being said, we ran out of time. And man, I'm telling you, TJ, we got to set up another show for you because I'm I'm energized. I'm energized Excellent. right now. Excellent. And while you, you haven't even heard about Small Biz Pro yet. And, you know, we got to talk about that. So it's 5 o'clock right now. And uh, this is a business zone with Crystal. And... Gilbert Buchanan, <laughs> <laughs> and our special guest is T.J. Uh, Laughlin, and uh, man, this has been a great show. We got to do it again. And this is- Gwen Lang Jones gave us that wonderful rendition and commentary on uh, why we must continue to celebrate Black History Month. And Excellent. Black History Month does not take place just in the month of February; it's a lifelong, it's, it's every year, day. It's year long. <laughs> Yes. And we are signing off and we will see you next Friday. We're out. Bye bye. Meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186.